to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Katie Novak. Katie works for the Chelmsford Public Schools in Massachusetts. She's the K-12 Reading Coordinator, Title I Director, and ELL Director. She also teaches graduate level courses on UDL. Um, she received her doctorate from Boston University and has been studying universal design for learning from a long, for a long time. She has been selected to do a number of things across the country, working with the Teaching Channel, the Gates Foundation, CAST. Um, she presents all over the place, even internationally, on UDL. And she is one of my very favorite people to learn from. I think you're in for a great treat this morning. Um, she also has a book that just came out recently. It's called UDL Now. It's fantastic. It's a fun read. It's a great read. First of all, while we're figuring this out, I just want to let you know that all materials that are um, on this presentation and accompanying handouts, I created a web page. Um, it's www.katynovacudl.com. Slash Baltimore, and I'll go there just in one second so you can see it, and that way if you'd prefer to follow along on your smartphone or your computer or your iPad, that's perfectly fine. I also added a bunch of addi um, additional optional tools that you might want to kind of check out while I'm talking if I talk about something that you want more background on. So we're going to pull that up really quickly. Also, how many people here are on Twitter? Okay, I might have to do some uh, marketing for Twitter here. But if you are on Twitter and you want to chat throughout the session, just use the hashtag UDLTowson, and I'll be checking it periodically. So if you have a question that you don't want to ask in front of everybody, you can just tweet the question, and I'll address it uh, throughout the presentation. Awesome. Oh, there we go. So if you check it out, it is www.katynovacudl.com, and then just backslash Baltimore. And this PowerPoint will be on it, a handout will be on it that you can see, and then again, the supplementary links. Okay, so just to kind of give you a little bit of background on myself, this is a picture of me in seventh grade. And I know you're probably thinking I was a child model or something like that, because I was blessed to have both cystic acne, a bad perm, and braces at the same time. But in seventh grade, all throughout high school, I was not a stellar student. I did fine. You know, I got B's all the time. I wasn't particularly engaged in anything in the classroom, although I excelled tremendously in sports and stalking boys that I liked. And I'm sure that some of you can relate. I couldn't memorize things for a math test, but I knew Casey Carney's locker combination from like watching him uh, next door. But it, it wasn't, school wasn't something that I was really invested in. I had no huge plans for the future. You know, I liked my teachers, I never got in trouble, but I didn't love school. That was until I met my nemesis, Mrs. Krauss. Now, how many of you have a teacher who was your nemesis growing up? Yes, Mrs. Krauss had the audacity to tell me that I was wasting it. I was wasting what? She's like, oh, it kills me. You have so much potential and you don't even care. And so she did the most horrible, unthinkable thing. She told me she was pulling me out of my regular classes. She was putting me in the honors program and I would eat lunch with her every day until I figured it out. Now this is a huge punishment when you are a junior in high school. So I was not happy about it at all. And in hindsight, I feel like I spent the whole year with her. It was probably like two weeks of missing lunch, but this was important time for boy watching. And I had to sit with the basketball team or the volleyball team. So I was like, no, I don't really know if that's the best decision for me. And then she of course called my parents and the decision was made. And so Mrs. Krause gave up her lunch for no other reason than she believed in me. And from that point forth, I got into the honors classes and I realized, wait, maybe I've just been bored because this is actually pretty cool. And I started getting into school much more and when I look back at how hard she worked to engage me, to really heighten the salience of goals and objectives for me, to make me realize the possibilities that could come out of schooling, it, it really changed my life. So I went on to do very well for my last two years of high school. I went to college. I graduated in three years from the University of New Hampshire. I went on to get my master's degree in education and then got my doctoral degree. I actually walked seven days before my due date for my first child and um, received a doctorate in education at BU. And when I look back, this would not have happened if it wasn't for Mrs. Krauss. And I don't talk to Mrs. Krauss anymore. I don't know where she is, but she changed my life. You all have to be Mrs. Krauss. You have to be, because for some kids, there is no other option. And goodness knows where kids could be if we don't help them, if we don't intervene, if we don't give up our lunch, 
And the best way that I know how to do this is UDL. So just take a second really quick so we can think about why we're here and tell someone next to you about your Mrs. Krause. Just for one minute, just to get the room buzzing. Go. Okay. So now that we're chatting a little bit and we've met our neighbors, we are going to start catering companies. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself that I haven't told you, okay? I'm obviously, because I'm a public educator, very, very wealthy. You all know. And so I throw these extravagant parties very much like Gatsby almost every weekend. And I'm looking for a caterer for my party. So each of your tables is going to be a catering company. So the very first order of business is to come up with a really fabulous business name because you don't want to hand out a, you know, a business card that doesn't have a really catchy name. And then once you do that, you're going to create a menu for my party that is just absolutely tremendous. Now. Okay, you have a catering company, so here's the text. You're gonna create a tasting menu, okay? What resources will you need? What kind of food will you serve, okay? So I just wanna give you maybe two minutes here just to start brainstorming. You're not creating a menu yet, but think about your strengths as chefs. Who do you know? What kind of party do you like to throw? Think themes, okay? So in the next two minutes, again, just come up with the name of your catering company and start chatting a little bit about what kind of food or what kind of theme you think you want for my party. And then we're gonna have a couple people share and then we're gonna move on to actually creating this menu. So take two minutes and start chatting. Working, and if you wanna look at the handout, which again, you can see on my website, um, the second page of the handout says the dinner party challenge icebreaker and it has the objective there, and then it talks about the background information a little bit, but then you have the following options as we move forward. Okay, you can choose to work you know, alone or in a small group if you feel like you, know, you wanna compete against your table, go for it. Um, if you do work in a group, you don't all have to write down. You, know, you can decide, maybe one person takes notes or maybe you'll just kinda discuss it. Okay? You can use you know, a menu template online. You can kind of search other catering menus. On my website, I did put a link to an exemplar catering menu if you want to get some inspiration. Okay? You can also use like Pinterest or any kind of website to kind of steal ideas. But what I want to tell you is when you're thinking about throwing a dinner party, I think the analogy is very similar to when you're planning classroom instruction. I've taught in classrooms from kindergarten to you know, graduate school, and when we sit down to plan lessons, often our minds go back to what are our strengths, okay? So I like to do, you know, I'm really good at, at lecturing, or I really like to show videos, or I, you know, I think that multiple choice questions are important because of this. So I start designing my lessons thinking about my own strengths. When in reality, UDL requires us to plan our lessons thinking about all possible variability. So before we start this activity, I do want to tell you that my guests have some dietary restrictions that you're going to need to pay attention to. So I have a friend who's lactose intolerant, one with a nut allergy, one who's gluten free, vegetarian weight watchers, okay? You need to create a menu for me so all of these people have an equal opportunity to have a really wholesome, delicious meal and a really great time at my party. This is what lesson planning has become for us. Okay? If you sit down systematically before a lesson and you say, what's all the possible variability or what's all the possible dietary restrictions you have, then you can create a really great menu. If not, you're stuck in accommodation land. So imagine you say, you know what, I'm doing an Italian theme. I'm doing like a meat lasagna, and I'm gonna do a, a dressing with a, you know, a, a really awesome Italian homemade dressing, and I'm gonna do bread, and I'm gonna do cake. And then my guests come, and you start going, oh, okay, all right, uh, I can throw some pasta on, just some pasta and salt, that'll be fine. And oh, what a shrew boy, I don't have dessert for him. I'll just run out and get like a, a thing of ice cream, that'll be fine. And vegetarian, that's a problem. Okay, uh, okay, salad, we'll just do the salad, it's just not to eat the, the meal. Accommodations are not the same quality. And when we accommodate our curriculum, we're giving some kids less than or we're stigmatizing certain kids. So I can walk over to you and be like, hey, I know that you can't have meat, so I just boiled you some pasta. And then you're the person sitting at the table with the bowl of pasta. It's the same thing when I go to a student and I'm like, hey, this is a graphic organizer just for you. The kid wants to die of embarrassment if you hand a graphic organizer out to one person. 
Okay, so what we're going to start doing is thinking about UDL as an analogy for this party. And so for the next five minutes with your group, come up with a menu that is equally nutritious, equally appetizing for every single person on my guest list. Ready? Go. And then we'll share out. Okay. So as I was walking around, the feedback that I'm hearing about the dinner party is very similar to the feedback that we talked about in the teacher's room about planning lessons. So, you know, one, one comment was, well, like, then I can't even, I can't even really make what I wanted to make. There is the nugget. We cannot teach the way we wanted to teach or the way that we used to teach or the way that's easier to teach. We just can't because not every student can learn. So how can we take a huge shift in our thinking to start embedding all of these guidelines so our, every one of our kids can meet the standards, so every person at our party can eat? Now, are there any catering companies that would like to share their name and then just a short description of the menu that they will be bringing to my party? Oh, fantastic. OK. So we're going to hear the name of the company and then the, the, the meal that I can expect. Well, there were eight of us. So we first called ourselves the Crazy Eights, but then we spelled it A-T-E-S. Oh, I love the pun. We are doing, we, we specialize in themes, and all kinds of themes, and so we, we hooked on the 4th of July, because we thought you would want to have a 4th of July party and have themes. And then we did it in, in bars. We did a fajita bar with a lot of options, um, gluten-free, tortillas, we're not. We did, well, well, let me start. We did an appetizer bar, and you can imagine, just lots of options in those things. We did a fajita bar, a hamburger bar with veggie burgers, turkey burgers, or beef burgers, uh, a salad bar, and then, of course, a dessert bar with, again, options for um, different types of whipped cream for the lactose-free person, um, and fruit, fresh fruit, and then lots of chocolate and stuff like that also. And finally, a real bar. Where, <laughs> where we would have unsweetened tea, so then people could add sugar if they preferred or not, and lots of options there, diet, regular Coke, or beer and wine. Okay, perfect. So what we're talking about here is providing a lot of different choices for everybody. So nobody feels awkward when they come back with their plate, because they've had full opportunity to get the same things as everybody else. And no one has to talk about dietary restrictions. I don't need to sit down and be like, why do you only have lettuce on your plate? And I'm like, oh, I actually don't eat meat, and everything has meat in it. Okay, Everyone has a nice full plate. Any other companies want to compete here? Perfect. Our company is entitled Freshly Delicious, and we specialize in providing diverse menus to meet every one of your guests' needs. Our special chef will tell you our specialties for dinner. <laughs> it's like a Shark Tank presentation. It is. Just so everybody knows, this was very easy because my mother has celiac, my husband has lactose intolerance, so does my daughter. My sister's an organic vegetarian, um, and so is her daughter. And my other daughter's a regular vegetarian, so every meal in my house is like this. Okay, so anyway, first of all, our webpage will have a picture to show that we do not cross-contaminate, all right? Because if the knife is used to cut the mango, then you're done, right? Okay. So uh, we decided to set it up with um, in, in a um, course type menu, starting with appetizers. And we decided to do a mixed bag, all different types of hummus. And of course, um, using um, non-GMO soy. All right, and so then we had um, also gluten, all the pita will be gluten free, all homemade pitas with different types of herbs. Then we did a soy, um, with uh, soy cheese and basil, Italian, things like that. Then we did wild caught shrimp with gluten-free cocktail, you can buy it at Wegmans, and um, <laughs> um, chicken strips, and we can make our own marinade with level B um, uh, maple syrup, honey, and amino acids, and roasted artichokes with um, lemon oil, lemon and olive oil. Then the great idea came from over here. We would do giant pans of roasted organic um, eggplant and then have different types of topping that would meet all of these needs. 
And by the time people are going to be so full, I think we'll just have fresh berries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a very technical menu, maybe the best I've ever heard in my life. So I would feel really comfortable about hiring that company if I was going to have a lot of different guests. Can we hear from one more company here, just so you can hear how different it is? Perfect. Name of your catering company? Universal Design for Eating. <gasps> Okay, so we went with kind of a hummus and fresh veggie appetizer, then a quinoa black bean taco with roasted sweet potatoes with chipotle and lime, um, then a mango and kiwi dessert, and then just to sort of beverage Okay, so in that one, that is basically one meal that every person can eat. So instead of choices, everybody gets the same plate, knowing that the dietary restrictions will not be a problem. So again, shift in thinking here. Reflect on how when you're planning a lesson, you're really planning a dinner party with a bunch of people who are different types of eaters. And these are not picky eaters. These are dietary restrictions. And, and before UDL, before we started systematically thinking different, we would a lot of the time say, these students need to be fixed. This kid doesn't have the right attention for this lesson. This kid's too slow at processing for this lesson. That's like calling these people picky eaters. It's, it's ridiculous because that's not true. They're just different and they have different requirements. And so it is our job to basically design a lesson that meets their requirements because ultimately they have to learn. So what is the ultimate goal of education? It's that kids know how to learn. That's the ultimate goal. At this point in my life, I could probably go out and learn about anything that I wanted because I know how. A lot of our kids, or even our, our adult students, don't know how to learn best. And granted, we all have content knowledge that they don't have, but even more importantly is not to just give them this knowledge and have them memorize it, but how to teach them to access this knowledge and to move forward in their own thinking. And that's something that we can support, we can provide coaching, but this is not something that we can do for them. And this is where it comes down to explicitly scaffolding how to learn. Okay, breaking up tasks into really small steps to give these, these kids or these students or these adults the tools that they need to be able to succeed on their own without us. So I want to talk for a quick second about Gene Anion and Hidden Curriculum. Who's heard of Gene Anion? Okay, good, so I won't be boring any of you with a repeat. So Jean Anion was a, a great educational psychologist and she, she passed away. But in 1980, she wrote the most amazing education essay of all time called The Hidden Curriculum of Work. And I actually um, put a link to the full text of that article on my webpage if you're interested in reading it. But what she did is she went into schools who had different socioeconomic status for their kids. So she called them based on the type of work they would probably do one day. So she had the working class schools, and these are kids in the schools that are high poverty. Most of their parents are not working or working in you know, very low paying jobs. You know, she moves middle class, affluent, and then she has elite schools. And these are the kids in the pockets where the parents are CEOs living in million dollar houses. And she wanted to see what is different about the experiences of these kids. And she found that it was not the curriculum that a lot of the times they were using the same textbooks. It was what she called the hidden curriculum. And what she said is the way that we treat kids in our classrooms, we are setting them up to behave that way in the real world. So in these working class classrooms, the teachers were very, very much focused on following rules. You will, this is our routine, we do this at 907, you will sit down, you will not ask why we do it, hands up, no time for questions right now, it is not time to go to the bathroom. When they walk down the hallway, we will be very quiet, we will be one behind each other, and it was really stressing on following routines, and she's saying, this is setting these kids up to work in jobs where you just do what you're told. On the contrast, and you can read about the whole spectrum in the article, the elite schools, it was very much like, Okay, this is what we're doing today. I just want to tell you about it. These are the objectives. What does everybody think? Can we make connections to what we were doing before? Anyone have any problems with this? Anyone feel like I should do it a certain way? And what she realized is, oh my goodness, these kids are being prepared to be CEOs. You know, they, they had the right to know what they were doing. There was always connection about engagement. Why is this important to you? Um, they, there was huge multiple means of expression. Okay, so I'm going to teach you this. How do you want to prove to me that you know this? And this was back in 1980, where they were pushing this creativity, this idea of choice, letting kids choose different stations. 
In contrast, of course, the working class schools were very, very rigid. So I think one of the most important things that you can do in, in moving towards you know, completely implementing UDL is you already know the guidelines and you already know the standards you're teaching. Up front, let the kids know what you're teaching and why and let them know how you're going to teach it by sharing what UDL is. And I have done this in classrooms as early as kindergarten and to be able to say to kids, okay, so these are the nine UDL guidelines. And of course, you may have to simplify the language. And you say, this is how I'm going to teach so you can all get it. And every couple of weeks, you're going to grade me on how well I'm teaching this. And they love it. My seventh grade students two years ago, I used to give them a report card for myself every Friday. And I would make a presentation. These are the standards that I taught this week. These are the, the UDL guidelines. I want you to give me a grade on how you think I did. And you know, it would be very open conversation, being like, I really think you were who did not do a very good job on explaining the function of raises and clauses. I failed that repeatedly. And I'd be like, well, what do you think I can do? And they're like, I, I don't know. Like, you're just pushing memorization. I don't think you really know what it is. And, but it was this really open, they were not being disrespectful. But when I was to give them feedback, they were so much more open because I allowed them to give it to me. And I just, for the end of the year, I got a C on that one. I never quite was able to get, get up there. But, so how do we meet the standards, okay? We know Common Core actually in the section application to students with disabilities, they mention universal design for learning as the strategy to make sure all kids are able to access these rigorous standards. And you know, the guidelines are broken up into these three you know, basic frameworks here. And so when you're thinking about how can you provide this information to students in a way that they think it's important, and that doesn't mean they think it's fun, they think it's important. And one thing I've heard through presenting is, oh, you can't make everything fun, everything can't be bells and whistles. Of course not. But if you can't make them realize why they need to know it, then why do they need to know it? Okay? The second is making sure that you represent it in multiple ways. And of course we know how to do this. You know, you have text, sometimes you have movies, sometimes you're talking, sometimes kids have a choice. And finally, the expression. How are they going to let you you know, know that they've learned something? And when I kind of looked at this, the Common Core Standards, and when I looked at the state standards, I realized there's really two different types of standards. And these lend themselves very differently to UDL guidelines. So the first, we have content standards. So this is what kids have to know. So I just went through the Massachusetts social studies curriculum and just pulled out an example. Kids need to be able to explain the meaning of the stars and stripes in the American flag and describe the procedure for you know, taking care of it. There is nowhere that says they have to write it. There's no way that says they have to present it you know, verbally. They could write a poem about it. They could make a Facebook page pretending they're the flag and presenting it that way. They could do a series of tweets. They could go on and do a presentation. They could make a talk show. Alternatively, you could teach it to them in a million ways. They could watch a video. You could just explain it and demonstrate it. You could have a veteran come in. You could have them research it on, on the internet. You could give them different choices. You go over there on the internet and check it out. Here's a really cool article. You can sit and listen to the veteran. Okay, there's no, there's no oversight as how you do this. And this is where you can add all of these choices and say, hey, I'm going to teach it to you in a bunch of different ways. You're going to give it back to me in a bunch of different ways. There's total freedom. It's going to be awesome. On the contrast, sometimes we have performance standards. This is when they have to do something. And a lot of times people hear about these and they're like, yeah, you can't really UDL reading. Or you can't really UDL an essay. They have to do it. They have to take a state standardized test. You know, we, we cannot move away from it. We can't make it UDL. But you can. Because when you have a method like kids have to use globe skills to determine absolute locations, you need to scaffold that and break that up into miniature steps to teach them how to do it. So when you're looking at your guidelines, you're thinking you're going to be really heavy on choice when there's the content standards. And you're going to be really heavy on uh, scaffolding and breaking it up into checklists when you're on the methods or the performance standards. So let's just reflect for a minute here. Thinking about a lesson that we have done in our career that has been a bomb. Okay, we all have them. I mean, I have tons of them. Okay, a lesson that you did, and I know we're all guilty of it. You took a content standard and you forced it to be a paper. How many, I mean, literally, I know everyone's done that. You're like, oh, okay, they have to understand what characterization is and they have to write an essay. Oh, uh, they have to understand, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, I'm going to have them do a speech. Okay. 
Take two minutes and think about a time and let the guilt set in, and then I'm gonna tell you how to release that guilt because it will never happen again. Okay, so talk for just a minute. So when you're thinking about your standards, and, 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 and having conversations, this is the same that I hear everywhere that I go, it's always that, well, they have, to, they have to know how to write, they have to know how to read, they have to know how to, to complete these math equations. They do, and that's a standard. But there are also standards that are content standards. And if, for instance, I really want to focus on, in English, the idea of point of view, a character's point of view, okay? If I require them to write an essay on point of view and they fail, is it because they don't know how to write or is it that they don't know what point of view is? So the whole idea when you're creating these lessons is glean your content standards first. What do they have to know? In subjects like history and science, you're gonna be heavier on your content. Whereas in math and English, you might be a little heavier on these actual performance tasks. But you're always gonna have them spread out. And give the kids a chance when you're teaching that content to, to express their knowledge to you in a way that is engaging to them. Because all you need to know is do they understand this? Do they have this knowledge? And I used to have like 100 different things on the board and kids could keep adding to it as they had more ideas about things they could do. And I would tell them, okay, this is gonna be a content standard. So I would go and I would teach whatever it was, metaphors, similes. And then I would say, okay, you need to give this back to me now and you could choose anything on the board. So it was things like they could write a sonnet, they could do a series of 10 tweets, they could make a comic book, they could make a mobile, they could you know, take a flip cam out into the hallway and create a commercial. And they had a choice. And I did say you can't choose anything more than three times throughout the whole year, just because you might have a kid who does a comic book literally you know, once a week. But once you know that they know the content and you have these you know, flexible groups where I can see when that assessment comes in, these five kids still don't get it. So now I can pull that group, make it really flexible, you know, kind of like on that RTI model, reteach, allow them to resubmit something. Once everybody knows it, then I move on to the performance task. Because now the issue is not that they have the content, they know it. Now they need to know how to write. And those are two very different skills. And when you're teaching how to write, or you're teaching how to solve an algebraic equation, or you're teaching how to use math skills, that's when you have to break it down into these miniature little steps and provide resources for every single step and exemplars for every single step and rubrics for every single step and to make them available for every kid in that room. And that's a, uh, is a, sh a shift from what we traditionally did where we made them available based on kids' IEPs. Now, IEPs are legal documents. We very much pay attention to them and all of those kids should be given all of those accommodations. But they're not accommodations if you start with them. It's really good instruction. And in a perfect world, if every teacher was doing UDL all the time, we wouldn't need these documents that say you have to make accommodations by giving rubrics and by checking in and clarifying directions and by having exemplars because that's good teaching and we should be doing it anyway. So as a quick reminder, the content standards, kids need you know, multiple options for how they're going to learn it. You know, you might show a video, you might do a demonstration, you might allow them to read, you might post a bunch of things at night on a website and pick one of these and explore it. Okay, choices that will engage their interest and challenge them, and then choices for how they're gonna demonstrate that learning to you. And that's when you can be so creative, and they'll come up with you with ideas that are like hilarious. So I teach a completely online college course. It's a graduate level course called Rap, Rock, and Poetry. And I teach the art of poetry only through rap music, through like Eminem and Big E, and, and, um, and what basically we do is, is they'll say, okay, well, this week we're gonna focus on form, poetic form. So you're gonna read about poetic form, you can watch these videos about poetic form, and then ultimately you can do one of the following. You can create a podcast where you present some sort of song where you rap and then analyze it. You can write a paper about the poetic form of a song. But even, I mean, these are, these are adults, many of them older than I am, and they still love like, I really get to pick whatever I wanna do. And I'm like, oh, you can collaborate with someone else. If you wanna create a group paper on Google Docs, that's totally cool. And everyone hands in something different because they're engaged because it was their choice. Method standards, on the other hand, okay, they do have to complete a task in a specific way. We know what a great writer and a great paper looks like. We have to teach that to them. And then, but we can still provide really flexible ways of presenting that content. We can still scaffold and provide work samples and we can still do graphic organizers and rubrics and constantly provide mastery oriented feedback, constantly walking around constantly monitoring those formative assessments to see who still needs my support. 
So we're going to step back really quickly and we're going to do um, a little activity because I think it's always important to kind of bring it down to a personal level so you can help generalize and transfer how important this is for kids because learning is like their whole world. So when you think about content standards and method standards, I, I feel like I need to present something called like UDL parenting, although I have like no at all skill to do that. But when you're thinking about your own personal life, a lot of the times we make requests of people in our life that are content standards and sometimes they are method standard. And I will tell you, people will always prefer the content standard. They'll always prefer not being told what to do. That's what a method standard is. You have to write a paper, this is how you do it. Okay, there's a form, you have to figure it out. This is how you solve an algebraic equation. This is how you do calculus, okay? So you're always gonna have a little bit of that pushback there of like, oh, why are we doing this? But if you look at, if I say to my husband, listen, I would love for you to have dinner on the table when I get home from a long day. Let's just shout out loud, what are some of his options? What choices does he have as far as getting dinner on the table? Takeout. Yep, he can do takeout. What else? Oh, a TV dinner. Loved those back in the day. Hire that catering group over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he could hire catering. Because again, that's very much within my budget as a public educator. Um, what else could he do? He could cook it himself. I'm not telling him how he has to do it. Okay, the standard is get dinner on the table. Now imagine, you know, husbands, wives, partners, everyone in here. He comes home and I say, you need to cook three times a week, you need to prepare meals that are less than 550 calories, and I need them to fit into the new food plate guidelines because the kids have nutrition requirements and that's how it has to go. First of all, he's gonna be PO'd because I'm being bossy. But secondly, there's no way he would even, like he's not a cook, he doesn't cook. I would have to break this down. I have to scaffold this. So I need to say, okay, here's a calendar, I'm gonna highlight your three days, this is when you're gonna do it. Here's like a bunch of recipes I picked out. They're all under 550 calories. Let's read them together, see if you have any questions about it. Okay, you know, this is the food plate. Do you wanna watch a video? He would think I was out of my mind. But in, in reality, when you say to an 11th grade student, we're gonna do a, do you do DBQs here? It's, it's basically an argument paper. So like you read like a Declaration of Independence and you have to have some sort of argument for it. And we call them DBQs. But if I say you are gonna do a DBQ, it will be between 300 and 400 words. You will use the, it's gonna be that, ugh. Okay, even with, the, even with the rubrics, even with the exemplars. And again, you're gonna have really successful kids on the task, but that's why you have to embed choice where you can. And sometimes, or a lot of the time, you can't. So that's why let's pull out that content and make that content really engaging and say, okay, you know what? I want you to know that you know the food plate guidelines. You can make a wrap, you can make, you do go home and do graffiti on the, you know, on a big sheet and bring in the graffiti. I had a kid who did graffiti for like the three things until it was up. He'd bring in these huge bed sheets with graffiti of his understanding and then he'd present how the art represented the concept. You know, and it gets wild. But that's so much more fun than you're going to read and then you're going to write about the food guidelines. So what I want you to do just to kind of have fun for a minute here is think about someone in your life. It could be a colleague, a child, a partner, and think about something that you would like them to do. That's your content standard. And then think about on the flip side, what do you really want them to do, which is the method standard. And like, I want it done in this way. And then just talk about and reflect on how it feels different. And then we're gonna talk about how to make that method standards less scary. So chat for about, let's see, four minutes here. For content and method standards in our own world. And just to, when you're thinking about your method standards, a really great strategy that I use is I actually make a list of like everything that kids would actually need to know to complete this successfully. So like if you're talking about, you know, an argument paper or completing a lab, what exactly does that require? So knowing how to write an introduction, knowing rhetorical strategies, knowing how to use transitions, knowing how to use formal voice, no, like, and you make a list and you're like, oh gosh, that's a lot of teaching. Okay, but that is what methods are, is you need to kind of break them up into their own content standards first so that's what I always do when I'm looking at a big task, a big method standards. Now one of my favorite method standards is the standardized test, okay? Kids have to take standardized tests. That's a method. There's ways to do really well on standardized tests. So what do you need to know how to do to do really well on the standardized test? Number one, you need to have the content and the knowledge. That's obvious, but that's our whole job all year. 
Number two, you need to know strategies for taking a multiple choice test. Number three, you need to know how to manage your time around such a task. Number three, you need to see exemplars of previous tests. Number four, you need to know how it's graded. Number five, you need to know how you performed the year before so you can make a goal. So I make these lists, and I don't mention standardized testing all year until it's right before the time, and then I teach it like a unit. And I break it down, and I'm like, okay, these are the things you need to know. Let's get through it, and then you're gonna ace this test. Because you know what? It's just another strategy that I can teach you. So if you start thinking about your method standards like that, and not looking at it as write an argument, because it's too vast, it's too big. But to write an effective argument, what skills do you need? Break those up, and then think about, some of those are actually content standards. Rhetorical strategies, for example, content standard. Varying sentence structure content standard. So pulling out some of those things and teaching those content in isolation and go, okay, now I know they know the difference between simple compound and complex sentences. Now I'm going to teach them to write and then I can just say, remember, use varied sentence structure. So this is a real billboard. This is Lance. As you see, his website is www.datelance.com. If you try to go to it, it is not active anymore. So I'm going to save you the trip. But it was real. Now it says, these are, his, he, these are his good points. Returned missionary, ex-BYU basketball player, Harvard MBA, love kids, and then question mark sense of humor. Now, this is Lance, and this was a legit way to find a date. He put up a billboard in Utah, and this was his way, like, you know, bigger than Match.com, better than Craigslist. So he put this billboard. Now you're gonna pretend Lance is your brother, okay? And you're gonna come up with a method standard. You need Lance to do something. And I used to start this, this with, you want Lance to take it down? And a lot of people were like, no, I don't want him to take it down. He needs to like market it better. So whatever you decide is in Lance's best interest, you're going to create a checklist of every single thing he needs to do to accomplish your method standard. So if your method standard is, Lance needs to take this down. There's gonna be steps involved in doing that. If your mission is, Lance really needs a better marketing strategy, what steps does he need to take? Okay, so have a little fun with Lance here and try to decide what you want him to do so he can get a better pool of ladies or gentlemen or whoever he's interested in. Okay, so take, a, uh, let's see, five minutes here and you can work together or you can work uh, alone to come up with a checklist for Lance. Okay, now let me tell you the real life story about datelance.com and then I want to hear how you're going to help your brother. And I, I went to about six or seven different tables and everybody had a different plan for him, which I found fascinating. But first of all, this is a legit billboard that was up, I found it like 10 years ago on, on a website. He owned a marketing company. And when people went to the website, he said, see, it worked. Like this was his whole thing of like just getting traffic. So when you went to datelance.com, it would redirect you to whatever logo works, which is his website, as kind of like a marketing scheme. Um, and the way that it was decided is Lance did work there with a bunch of his buddies and he was single. And his buddies came up with this idea. So he was actually looking for someone but would not have maybe gone this path. And his friends are like, this is the best idea ever because we'll get more website traffic. Generally, it's a, a harder demographic to get adult women to go to like a marketing site and things like that. And so apparently it worked out for them pretty well. But how, what were our plans for Lance here? Does anyone, any group want to share their checklist for our dear brother Lance? First of all, how many, and I promise I won't force you to talk, but raise your hand if you wanted Lance to keep the billboard up. So one, two, see, it's so funny, like seven groups like the billboard. How many of you wanted him to get it down? Okay, and anyone have something that was like either or, like modified, who wanted to modify the billboard? Okay, so again, different things. Now, would anyone be willing to share their method standards for Lance? And you know I got mean wait time. Okay, here we go. Love to hear what we're gonna do. We're gonna break up this task so Lance knows exactly how to be successful. We decided it needed to be updated and more interactive, so we were going to plant a huge QR code on the side so you could pull off, take a picture, we download the app, take a chance with Lance, and take you to a real website where you could learn 
<laughs> that is a brilliant marketing strategy. The QR code pulling over on the freeway, amazing. Any other ideas here for Lance? Okay. We talked about how it was interesting that he, it says a little bit about him, but not really, doesn't narrow down the potential market. It doesn't really explain what he's looking for. And we write up that over 2,000 people replied to this, and that maybe by saying a little more what he's looking for might help narrow that down. Right. Yeah, I mean, very important, very important topics here. But when you're thinking about methods, so often we already know how to do the whole thing as a package. And so when we're, you know, when you're breaking it up, a lot of the times you, you don't think about the minute steps in between. What does this require to be successful? And I was talking to a group over there, and they're saying they actually involve students in this and say, okay, we're going to be writing, you know, whatever it is. We're going to write a response to literature and science, or I'm sorry, a response to informational text and science. What do you think you need to be successful on this task? have the kids come up with the first ideas, then of course your content expertise, you know there's things that are there that they might not know and kind of add them in. So yeah, that's a really great start. You will need to know format, you will need to know transitions, but also I need to teach you this. Um, also, I got a couple of questions just about math in general, saying, you know, okay, I, I get the idea behind this, this makes a lot of sense, but in math, sometimes it's just x plus two equals four, you know, what is x? And so the math teacher that I've worked with for many years is amazing at UDLing on math. And what he'll do is you take a concept like we were talking about surface area. And a lot of the times math will be, okay, this is what surface area is. Here's the traditional formula. Here is a box. Figure out the surface area. And he's really good about saying things like, here's a box, okay? Choose one of the following scenarios and write a response which incorporates your understanding of surface area. So one of the ones that he did was, um, you own a painting company, you just sent out a quote to a woman for painting this space, and she wrote back saying it was way too expensive because the room was only 10 feet long. And respond. Think about how much more critical thinking that would involve. Dear Mrs. Whoever, um, you know, I understand that you're very upset about this estimate. However, let me explain to you how I actually had to measure the room. First of all, wall one was, and to kind of go through and getting into their thinking of what is surface area with beyond what the formula is. But do they understand what the formula you know, stands for? Also, um, my, mark, my math partner did a, a fun thing on X, so the variable X, like what is he? And they had to personify X and become X and had a bunch of different choices to kind of communicate what his job was. So you, know, you could do a personal ad in middle school. Hi, my name is X. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I stand in for more important numbers, what, you know, whatever it is. Um, you could also do it through a poem. You could do it through, you know, a poster and visual, a comic book. He also does, um, if he does a concept, he often will say, create um, a lesson or a game so you could teach this to first grade. And then he'll send, um, not send, he'll Skype with a first grade class in town, and the kids will actually vote on what the best lesson is, and they'll Skype the first grade classroom, and they'll show them the lesson. So there is a lot of ways to do this in math as well. And it's, again, thinking about pulling out that content when it's there to make that a lot more creative. So are there any questions about that? Okay, so the final few minutes here, what we're gonna do is, whoop, I call this the speed dating protocol. And we're going to review everything you kind of learned in the session. And I know this one has been very general, kind of talking about more uh, just philosophical changes. In the next part of the session, we're going to talk about how does this impact class instruction. So we're going to immerse ourselves in a lesson that includes all the EDL principles and we'll stop and reflect. But I do this all the time with kids. It's awesome in kindergarten. It's awesome with adults. Everybody kind of stands up. You go find a date. Okay. If you're doing it with young kids, you might call it like friend meetings or something like that, okay? And you're gonna have four two-minute dates where you're gonna go up to somebody you've never met before. And for the first couple of seconds, you're gonna do like a dating question. Like you might say, okay, what's your favorite movie of all time? Or you might say, what's your favorite food? Or, you know, anything. Get to know each other. Then you're gonna spend the last almost two minutes just kind of talking about what are your feelings about this session? How is it going? Is there anything new you're thinking about? Are there any questions that you have? Okay, so what I want everyone to do is stand up, please. And what we're going to do 
first is without talking, you need to find everyone in the room with your same birthday month. Without talking. Let's see this work. Congregate. Find everyone with your birthday month in the room. Okay, I'm seeing more than 12 groups, and I think there's 12 months. So start looking around for other groups. You're all amazing at this. Look at this. This is a high-functioning group here. Oh, we got the paper. Love it. Okay, I see May marching in the back. <laughs> wow, this is fast. Okay, we'll give it 30 more seconds and then we'll see how it shook out. Okay, when I say your month, you're just going to give like a woo or some sort of noise. Okay, where's January? Woo! Sweet February. Woo! March. Woo! Oh. <laughs> March doesn't seem very happy about their birthdays. April. Woo! May. Woo! Wow, that's a big group. Happy birthday. June. Woo! July, Woo! August, Woo! <laughs> two, there's only two of you, that's amazing, September, two of you too, October, Woo! wow, this is, we need to do some sort of study on this birth month here, November, Woo! and December, okay, your first date is going to be with someone who is in your birth month. Okay, I'm going to put my timer on two minutes. If there's not an even number, you can do three in a group. That's totally fine. Start talking about UDL and don't forget your getting to know you question. Ready? Two minutes. Go.
one more connection. And during this last connection, you're going to find someone new to chat with. And what I want you to talk about is which UDL guidelines were, were present that you noticed in my presentation so far this morning. So find a new friend for the last two minutes, and then I'll let you know that we'll have time for a break. So start mingling, walk around, find a new friend. Now, what we're gonna do now is totally immerse in the UDL experience. So we talked about basically, the, the first part of the session was really a shift in thinking. So like a philosophical shift in what do we have to teach, which are you know, our standards, how can we break them apart, and how do they lend themselves to different UDL guidelines? Because I know you already have background in the UDL guidelines. And as I was presenting that, I actually channeled most of the UDL guidelines and that there was a lot of time for collaboration, that's really important. There was a lot of ways for you to customize the display of information so you could look at the, the presentations on your own computers. We talked a lot about um, basically activating your background knowledge, allowing you to reflect, to monitor your own progress. That's important in any learning experience. But right now, we are gonna move to two standards, okay? So my content standards of this next presentation is give examples of nominalization and how to avoid it. Now, if you have a strong English background, you may have heard of nominalization, but it's not something you probably teach frequently. Some of you might be like, I've never even heard of it, and that's okay. But before we move on to the method standard, you need to understand what nominalization is. The method standard is you're gonna write an introduction of a cover letter for your dream job. And in it, you're going to avoid nominalization. So I teach a graduate business writing class. Writing a cover letter is very, very important. I can't tell you how often I've read cover letters of my friends who are super well-educated and phenomenally qualified. And I'll read the cover letter and be like, oh, please don't send that. That's, that's not what needs to be in a cover letter, or it's written with too much nominalization, okay? So what we're gonna do is I, I Googled like unique jobs, because I always think it's fun to have like these engaging options to understand what you're doing before you apply it to something really important to you. So there is a real job of a dog food tester. There's humans that try dog treats. I think it would be amazing. Next, jelly donut filler. I, I could, waste a minute doing that. Okay, there's also golf ball divers. These are people who work for the resorts who have to go in to get all the ones in like the water. <laughs> Citrus fruit colorer, real job, okay? This is, what they do is they pick fruit like oranges off when they're like kind of like shrivelly and brown, and then they inject them with chlorophyll to make them look fresh. And this is a job to be the colorer. Or you can choose an educator, like a real cover letter that you would write. But I always like the option to kind of be out there. So I'm going to immerse you in this lesson, which I designed for my graduate students in business writing using the UDL guidelines. Now, the first thing you need to know is what is nominalization. So what I'm going to start with is just a video, because some people it's great to watch a video, and this provides the background information that you'll need. Then we'll go through some scaffolded practice, and then I'll go through how to write a cover letter. So we're just gonna start with this video, which is so practical if you teach um, in university at all, or if you teach older students, this is so important for communication. So this is just a short video, five minutes, but we'll give you the background information you need to be able to move on with this lesson. Adjectives such as implacable, or a verb like proliferate, or even another noun, crummy, and add a suffix such as ity, or tion, or ism, you've created a new noun, implacability, proliferation, crummyism. Sounds impressive, right? Wrong, you've just unleashed a flesh-eating zombie. Nouns made from other parts of speech are called nominalizations. Academics love them. So do lawyers, bureaucrats, business writers. I call them zombie nouns because they consume the living. They cannibalize active verbs. They suck the life blood from adjectives. And they substitute abstract entities for human beings. Here's an example. The proliferation of nominalizations in a discursive formation 
may be an indication of a tendency toward pomposity and abstraction. Huh? This sentence contains no fewer than seven nominalizations, yet it fails to tell us who is doing what. When we eliminate or reanimate most of the zombie nouns, so tendency becomes tend, abstraction becomes abstract, then we add a human subject and some active verbs, the sentence springs back to life. Writers who overload their sentences with nominalizations tend to sound pompous and abstract. Only one zombie noun, the keyword nominalizations, has been allowed to remain standing. At their best, nominalizations help us express complex ideas, perception, intelligence, epistemology. At their worst, they impede clear communication. To get a feeling for how zombie nouns work, release a few of them into a lively sentence and watch them sap all its energy. George Orwell played this game in his essay, Politics in the English Language. He started with a well-known verse from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. It says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Now here's Orwell's modern English version. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. The Bible passage speaks to our senses and emotions with concrete nouns, descriptions of people, and punchy abstract nouns such as race, Battle, riches, time, chance, not a zombie among them. Orwell's satirical translation, on the other hand, is teeming with nominalizations and other vague abstractions. The zombies have taken over and the humans have fled the village. Zombie nouns do their worst damage when they gather in jargon-generating packs and swallow every noun, verb, and adjective in sight. So globe becomes global, becomes globalized, becomes globalization. The grandfather of all nominalizations, anti-disestablishmentarianism, contains at least two verbs, three adjectives, and six other nouns inside its distended belly. A paragraph heavily populated by nominalizations will send your readers straight to sleep. Rescue them from the zombie apocalypse with vigorous verb-driven sentences that are concrete and clearly structured. You want your sentences to live, not to join the living dead. Okay, now if you turn to the handout, the packet for this, this session, there is, it's on page nine, it says, what is nominalization? And it, it gives you some background if you're interested, why should you understand nominalization and how to revise to avoid it, if you're interested in that background. And then it also gives some reasons to avoid nominalization, and this all comes from business writing textbooks. And then also on page 10, there's some examples that we can practice for a little bit. So there's three sentences on page 10. In the packet. Whoa, what is happening here? No, the handout is online on the web space. Yeah. So if you go to um, katynovakudl.com slash Baltimore, you can see a copy of it. I'll project it as well. I just have to find the internet here. Okay, Safari. Okay. So we're gonna practice three sentences together. 
just to make sure that everybody kind of gets how they really bog down a sentence. So if you go to the website, woo, it says under keynote materials, the view download, the key, keynote handout. So if you want to use this later. Okay, where is it? Right here? Right there? Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so here is page 10. Thank you all for your wonderful tech support. Okay, so right here, the, oh, the first sentence is, and we see sentences like this all the time, the steering committee raised an objection to the proposed parking garage north of the stadium. Okay, what is the nominalization in sentence number one? You can just call it out. Objection. So the sentence would be much more active if it read, yeah, the steering committee objected. Okay, that is really tight quality writing. And a lot of the times, you know, we're guilty of it ourselves, but especially our students, they think it sounds smarter to use bigger words. And what ends up happening is they start adding nominalizations because they want to up their word choice, but they end up really losing out on their meaning because they can no longer express their ideas clearly. Okay, so number two, until well into the 20th century, the judgment as to whether same-sex twins were identical or fraternal was largely based on appearance. Okay, and there are a couple in there. So what are the nominalizations in sentence number two? Judgment. judgment. Appearance. Okay, so think about it at your tables now. We won't do it out loud. How could you revise that sentence? You can either write it or say it out loud to avoid nominalization. Remember in the video how sometimes you actually have to add a subject. answers, people talking in their tables. Did anyone come up with something like, until the 20th century, people judged as, 
you know, whether same-sex twins were identical or fraternal based on how they looked or based on how they appeared. It's just much more concrete and it gets rid of some of those abstract nouns. Nominalization, hugely important with our ELL population. Some languages do not have nominalization in them. If you have a student that comes from a language where there is no such thing as nominalization and they are reading nominalizations, you have lost them. There's nothing to translate from. So some languages are written you know, completely in just subject, verb, very active, and they don't, they don't take these, these verbs or adjectives and transition them. So again, we, we want to avoid these nominalizations. Now I'm going to show you a very typical cover letter. I see a lot of these, okay? And again, some of you are going to look at this and go, oh my gosh, that's like a cover letter. Okay, given my admiration for ponies and my lifelong love of the art of massage, I felt excitement when it came to my attention that you had availability to begin the hiring process for a mayor masseuse at the Holistic Horse Hotel. I believe my qualifications, education, and experience make me a perfect candidate. Please allow the following communication to serve as a demonstration of my interest in the position. That's like half the cover letters that I screen for positions that I'm hiring for. Use the, uh, you know, admiration, excitement, qualifications, communication. Nowhere here do I know what this person does. There's nothing active. Okay, I don't know how they found out about the job. I don't know, you know, there's basic, my penchant for ponies and, you know, lifelong art of massage, but it's not direct, it's not action oriented. So as a screener, I'm gonna toss it because, you know, I need to be spoken to. Uh, I posted a job for a seventh grade English teacher a couple weeks ago and got 700 applicants, okay? I don't have time to read nominalization, okay? If you, don't, if you don't get to people right away, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, where is this going? I'm just going around in circles. I need somebody who's qualified, okay? So, what we're gonna do now is now that you kind of understand the content of nominalization, I want you to kind of reflect with your tables for a minute what is nominalization? And if you think it would be helpful, go back into the handouts that I posted, or you can rewatch the video that's on the website as well. And just take a minute so you understand what nominalization is, and then we're going to talk about writing that cover letter. So chat for a minute. Okay, so let me just tell you how this would be different if we revised it. Now, again, we read it, and a lot of us are like, that's good writing. Sounds really smart. Okay? Because I mean, it, there's nothing bad, I mean, grammatically it's correct, but what if I were to say, I was so excited to learn that you're hiring a mare masseuse at the Holistic Horse Hotel. With 12 years in horse massage and a graduate degree from Boston University in massage, I am a perfect candidate, please allow me to explain. Now I've gotten rid of all the nominalizations, you actually understand what my qualifications and education are, so I'm not being abstract anymore, I'm being really concrete, and I've gotten right to the point. So the reader knows I have over a decade of experience, I have a graduate degree in this, I'm excited about this exact position, whereas all this other stuff is fluffy fluffy. So this is really important for our, our students as they're moving into, I know AP exams, you know, and things like that when they're in high school, also, you know, GREs, graduate programs, um, any kind of things, even the teaching exams that we take, you know, they look at, there's a lot of essay writing. And as one lens of revision, you want to try to think, am I being as active in my voice as possible? So that's why nominalization is important. So let's now talk a little bit about the cover letter. So there's my horse for my horse masseuse. That would be a really hard job. Like a horse masseuse, their muscles are big. Okay, so step one, when I'm talking about in my, in my business writing class, a lot of people get really caught up on format and I think this is true from kindergarten to 12th grade, and the Common Core now really focuses on this idea of writing as a process. So the first thing you wanna do is really kind of just draft your ideas. Don't worry about are you using nominalization, are you using sentence structure, like basically why are you a good candidate and what position are you interested in? We're gonna kind of draft that out first, okay? The next step is we're gonna go in and look and see did I use nominalization, okay? How can I convert it to a more active voice and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of switch off and we're gonna proofread and really kind of tighten up that language and make sure that nominalization is gone, but also to have somebody say, well, you don't really say why you're qualified for this position, or you don't really say how you heard about it, okay? And to kind of tighten it up that way. So again, this is my example that I already wrote, and this would be step one. Then I would go back and I would revise for step two, and I would give it to somebody 
always give your cover letters to somebody, whether it's a partner or a uh, colleague. Always have somebody else kind of read it so they say, oh, that doesn't make sense right there. Okay? And then we're going to kind of share those with each other. So let me go back to your choices of jobs. Okay, so again, it can be your real cover letter. You can be a teacher, but if you feel like, oh, I already have that cover letter done, then you could maybe aspire to be a dog food tester. In the first five minutes here, you're just gonna kind of draft your ideas. You can write it on paper, you can do it on your phone, you can do it on your iPad or your laptop, but just kind of think of the ideas. How can you say that you are interested in this job and qualified for this job? And don't worry about the nominalization because this is just drafting. You can work together if you'd like or you can work alone. So five minutes, I'll walk around, come up with that intro as best as you can, but don't worry about the format or the language. You may begin. Okay, now, did, would, did anyone here, I went to that side of the room, and no one is aspiring to be a citrus fruit colorer? Anyone on this side? That is just not a popular, people are like ethically against making our fruit look right. We do have a lot of golf ball divers though. Somebody's BYOF, bring your own snorkel. That could be huge, okay? But basically what, what we're doing here is the ultimate goal when I teach this in business writing is for them to be able to go home and write a real cover letter that avoids nominalization and is to the point. And it happens by doing this lesson. So even though it seems like kind of silly, you know, and oh, you know, whatever, this is so, you know, we're not actually gonna be a, a jelly donut filler. We do this in class, everybody has a good time. They go home, all the resources are posted, they can watch the video again. If you look on my website, I do post sample cover letters and a number of different resources for how to write a cover letter, and that's that embedded scaffolding. Because some of you are like, oh, I totally get the format. I just wanna pull back on nominalization. Some people are like, I don't even have one yet, especially in college, I need to write one, and they will look at those resources. So that's that whole idea of embedded scaffolding. I'm not saying, tell me if you have a cover letter. You don't, here's a uh, scaffold. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to teach our students what they need to be successful. And what you're gonna find when they're a little bit younger is sometimes they won't use them. So if I'm gonna do an activity, I might say, okay, we're gonna start this cover letter um, over here on the table, you know, come up and get it if you want it. I have a rubric if you're interested. I have some sample cover letters if you're interested. I have some worksheets on nominalization. If you wanna go over to the computer lab, I already have some links up where you can watch some more videos. You can work together. And then I do all this and I walk around. And what I see is there's a student who is not getting started. And I sit down and I'm like, okay, what's going on? And they say, I don't know how to write a cover letter. I'm like, okay. So what do you think, what would help you? Well, I don't know. I'm like, well, when I write a cover letter, I find it helpful to read an exemplar. So I'm gonna go up and get the exemplar. And then I bring it back and I'll sit down and I'll say, okay, as I'm reading this, I start to say, oh, okay, this is important. And then I'll go and put it back. And be like, if you think that would be helpful, go get it. And nine times out of 10, they'll get up and get it. But if you're the one who's always giving the student the resource, they don't know that they need it to complete the task. So this whole idea of providing a graphic organizer over and over and over again, how helpful is that if that student at the end of the day doesn't know why he or she is using a graphic organizer or how to create his or her own graphic organizer? Okay, this is things, again, it goes back to the beginning. We have to teach these kids how to learn. And this requires us putting out all the tools they may need, talking about how they're important, and then leading them to use them if they are not. And that's where the mastery-oriented feedback comes in, having them monitor their own progress. So let's say that you did hand in a cover letter and it was, it was horrible. That's an awesome opportunity for me to say, look, on the rubric you didn't meet any of these criteria. Tell me what you did in preparing to write this. Did you look at this resource? No. Did you look at this resource? No. Okay, so let's talk about that. Another really cool thing on tests is I do this on any single assessment I've ever done is on the bottom I'll say what do you think you got on this and why? And it's never punitive so I'll say to the kids if you didn't study for it, that's fine. That's, you know, I'm not gonna lecture you about this. But if you studied for it and failed, I'm concerned. If you chose not to study for it and failed, then I feel a little bit better about it that, that I did my part and you didn't do your part. And they will tell you everything and the things you don't wanna know. You know, how do you think you did on this? Oh, I'm sure I got a zero. Last night I wanted to take my girlfriend to the movies instead of studying. But that's good information as a teacher because now you can sit down with that student and say, okay, let's talk about decisions. Let's talk about why it's important to do well in this class so you can move on to the next step. And use that information to really connect. 
So basically, what I wanted to do in this, this keynote this morning, and I know there's only a minute, is to number one, have you think differently about of UDL and about the fact that it's really systematic from the beginning. It's like planning a party. Before you plan a lesson, whether you teach college or kindergarten or early childhood, sit down and think about all the possible variability. Then think about, am I teaching content or am I teaching a method? Am I teaching knowledge or am I teaching something they have to do or a way they have to behave? And if so, what UDL guidelines lend themselves best to the, the ultimate goal or my objective? Then start developing, if it's a content standard, with a lot of choice in mind, a lot of engagement. And if it's a method, start breaking it up into which steps do I actually have to teach and which of these steps are actually content hidden within a method. And from there, communicate that to your students and say, this is the process I went through in designing this lesson. These are the standards we need to meet. This is how we're going to meet it. And this is why it's important. Does anyone have any questions? And if you continue to move that and move forward, regardless of what you teach, your kids are going to be more invested in their own education. They're going to learn how to learn. And they're also going to connect to you so you can ultimately be that teacher who puts them on a path to success. And so when they look back in a couple of decades, you will be the person that they're thanking because you taught them how to learn. So I hope you have a fabulous 90-minute lunch. That's like 10 times longer than your average lunch during the year. So enjoy every minute. Feel free to swallow. And I'll see some of you, I'm sure. Um, I'll be doing one of the breakout sessions after lunch, so I'll see some of you again. But Miss Liz Berquist is making a short announcement. So thank you so much.